Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Remastered Podcast. Today's episode is a special one, a one that we decided to do on Monday, September 26th, when we lost, they say, one of the most influential, in my opinion, the most influential, the most impactful, the greatest Islamic scholar that walked the face of this earth this past century, uh, Dr. Yusuf al Qaradawi. May Allah have mercy on his soul. And so we brought together this incredible panel of speakers, uh, Dr. Hisham Abdallah, Dr. Hima Atif, and Brother Ahmed Sakr, um, from across the country, um, people from different generations, different experiences, different walks of life, to tell us and talk to us about what impact he had on their lives, and as such, the, the lives of so many other Muslims and people across the world. Um, for those listeners um, who may not be familiar with Sheikh Dr. Yusuf al Dawi, he was a, a scholar um, in, in, in all realms of the world, not, the word. Not only was he a scholar of fiqh and sirah and tafsir and hadith, but he took all of this, all of these studies and really showed the Muslim world how to live Islam, how to think about the goals and the spirit behind all of this, uh, the, this the, these things and really make them part of our life. He believed in our ummah. He pushed us to the limits. He believed that that, that we could go, uh, we could grow and we, be, we could become um, impactful again. Um, and he made sure to travel the world to remind all of us about um, about our religion and, and, and where it can take us, alhamdulillah. Um, Muslims around the world look to him for questions on, about how to navigate their lives in the modern world. He used uh, the radio when it first came out, he used the TV, and then the World Wide Web, the internet. He himself modernized himself so that he could continue to do his da'wah and call Muslims across the world to the moderate, balanced approach to Islam that he so um, wonderfully expressed. And so that's just an introduction about him, um, about myself, subhanAllah, I forgot to mention that my name is Iman Ateya. I am the National Tarbiya Director, um, and I'm honored again to be uh, joined by our guests, each one, and I, I am residing in Dallas, so each one of them will tell us a little bit about themselves, where they are, and maybe tell me just the beginnings of um, when you think about Sheikh Yusuf al Qaradawi, um, what is uh, some of the adjectives, some of the characteristics that come to mind? So let's start with um, Dr. Hisham Abdullah. Um, one of uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. Um, one of the best descriptions I heard about Sheikh Yusuf al Qaradawi from another uh, very well established scholar is that Sheikh al Qaradawi huwa damir al ummah, he's the conscience of the ummah. And I'll just leave it at that. That's the best description I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. Tell us about yourself, Dr. Hisham. Where are you right now? Um, I am in Virginia. And uh, after uh, residing in uh, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, California, and then back to Virginia. <laughs> and I am living here uh, close to my daughter and my grandson and with my wife, of course, and my, uh, the rest of the family is uh, my wife and here, uh, also my son, one of my sons. I have five children, four grandchildren, um, so the, our family resides uh, in Virginia and in okay. California. So uh, we are, we're scattered. Um, I've been with Mass since its inception back in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've uh, been proud of being part of this. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I went, uh, you know, I, I assumed uh, several, I was given several uh, positions. Uh, locally and nationally, I was at some point uh, the chairman of the board of trustees and a uh, member of the executive committee, Terbiya coordinator, etc. So that was the focus uh, early on. And then maybe I switched a little bit more to studying um, Sharia and, uh, and, and, and um, um, education, uh, given you know, classes when, when possible, etc. Um, I have formal studies in uh, Sharia ah, as well as in organizational management and uh, clinical pharmacology. Mashallah. Yes, my, my day job is the clinical pharmacology one. SubhanAllah. May, may Allah reward you for your, your years of service and, and your knowledge and your experience I mean, yeah. given to, um, to the Muslims in this country. SubhanAllah. And you mentioned clinical pharmacology. So that takes me to Dr. Iman Atif. She's got that connection with you, right? Of course, uh, of course. She's a colleague and uh, not just a mass sister. She's also a, a colleague in science, yeah. Inshallah. Introduce yourself, Sister Iman, and tell us a little bit about when you think about Sheikh Dr. Yusuf al what comes to mind? 
Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, so my name is Iman Atif. Again, I have a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences, so that's basically one other connection with Dr. Hisham. Um, we lived in Kuwait, Cairo, Boston, um, North, Car North California, and then now in uh, Greater LA. Uh, but actually, it got involved with mass since the beginning, I think in 1996 when I landed in, in Boston. Um, I have three kids and was mostly involved with the youth and then switched back to Tarbiya and then back to youth. So back and forth in different chapters. I've briefly joined uh, uh, some boards in, in the different messages and also in mass in different chapters. Um, I also enjoy um, being briefly be, being part of the Girl Scouts of America. So I was a Scouts leader. Um, so that's about myself. I have three kids and I, currently I'm in LA. Uh, it's very hard to describe Sheikh Dr. Qaradawi in one word or a phrase or a book. Uh, I can tell you one thing that will tell you how much I, I, I actually uh, respect him. So I interviewed him in, I think it was 1998 in wow. Maya convention. And most of the time, if you interview a speaker, because I was in the, uh, was a part of the media uh, team in the in Maya, most times if you interview a speaker, you remember what they tell you. Mm -hmm. All what they remember is that I spent some time with him and he was talking to me and I can't remember a single word mm -hmm. from the majesty of the situation. So just being in his presence had an overwhelming feeling of respect to being in an overwhelming presence of a huge island and new, a huge knowledge and a huge wisdom that I can't even remember a single word that he saw me. So to describe him in a word, word, he, he in multiple, multiple words, and you need, you need books to describe him from, from my part. So I just, can mm. describe him. Jazakallah. Iman, mashallah alaikum. How about Brother Ahmed? Can you introduce yourself and tell us what comes to mind when we think about Sheikh Yusuf al Qardawi? Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Khukum fillah, Ahmed Saqr. I grew up in the Midwest um, where I spent most of my time uh, mentoring Muslim youth in America, from personal coach to founding several community building initiatives that were uh, very innovative to bringing people together. Currently, I oversee, I'm lucky to be part of a great team, Mass National team, and overseeing all the programming across the country. And my area of focus is empowering young professionals in the United States. Uh, to echo what Sister Iman said is that, you, how can you describe a man that who would take an encyclopedia to describe the man who wrote all the encyclopedias on Islamic uh, knowledge and, and set the standard. But when I think of him, it comes to mind as he was not only a trailblazer, but he was the North Star of our community. And that people look to him for guidance and inspiration in times of difficulty, in times of uncertainty. And that when we lost him, it was that we lost someone that we all hold dear to our hearts. SubhanAllah. Very well said. You know, catching, going on from that, what you just said, Brother Ahmed, you said that he was the North Star. And sometimes when you're the North Star and you're so far beyond the common folk, you start to have ideas and things that are not necessarily accepted. And many years later, the rest of the fuqaha and the rest of the ulama and the rest of the community realize, you know, the ilm that you had and the, the thought and the vision that you had. This is something that Sheikh Yusuf al-Qadda was very well known for. Mani Fatawa that he made that, people were like very over, you know, how could he say this? How could, and then now we're realizing that his ideas were the right ideas and they were the best. So him really challenging the status quo and, and, and questioning really, uh, the, you know, the best way to, to, to make sure that we take his time to the next age. That being said, you know, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Hashem, um, when you think about Sheikh Yusuf al what do you think it was about him? What was his most unique characteristic or, or some of his unique characteristics that helped him appeal to millions of people, even though his knowledge was so vast, but still he connected to millions of people. What was it about him? So many things actually. One is 
the the Allah alam, you know, now he passed away, we can praise him as much as we can because this is what uh, our adab is uh, from the Sahaba, is that we shouldn't praise people so much until they pass away, then we can actually shower uh, the praise. So ikhlas, his, his sincerity was just subhanAllah, and it's amazing. One brother said that Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi was visiting the Muslim students in Japan, and he, they, they arranged a meeting for him, and there was only three or four people that attended. And the brother who arranged this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, or this meeting was actually so embarrassed and say, and he started apologizing to, to, to Sheikh Yusuf for, for this meager audience, you know, amount and so on. But he said that the Sheikh did not care for one second how many people, and he, you know, it was even if there's one person, he was, he, he speaks the same way and with the same passion whether he's in, in a, you know, on, on, that, on TV and watched by millions of people, or he's in a, in a room with, with one individual. And that gives you the, the, the level of ikhlas. Now, the second characteristic of Sheikh Yusuf is that he is, he's so well connected to, to his roots of, you know, the village. He speaks, he speaks, you know, like immaculate, like fusha, right? He never makes any mistakes in that, of course, you know, like, but at the same time, his language is like the language that you would hear from your, you know, your, your father, your grandfather, or the person on the street. He is Ibn al-Qarya. He calls himself Ibn al-Qarya wal kutab He is the son of the village and the kutab, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, the Quranic uh, school for, for children. Uh, mm -hmm. so this simplicity in the way that he expresses the most complex a, a, a concept of Islam. And he writes not only for the, the, the lay people and amma, he writes also for the mutakhassasin, for the specialists. Mm -hmm. When you look at his, 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 his writing is as smooth when he presents the different fiqh opinions about, you know, a, 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 about fiqh al-zakah as when he is presenting the principles of ibadah in Islam. This simplicity, which is called in Arabic, the easy, but at the same time, is like it's so heavy and, and, and you have to think about it, reflect about it. Mm -hmm. um, these are you know, some of the characteristics. I can go on for the rest of the hour. I don't want to do that. I but love what, it's really, it's amazing. It is. So you remind me, Dr. Hisham, about two of the books that, that I have, two of the, the, some of the books that I have from Dr. Sfukar Dawi. One of them is the one on ikhlas, sincerity. You know, he writes a beautiful booklet. It's been translated by mass. It's available on our website. Just, you know, you can, you can see his ikhlas coming through those between the lines. The beautiful booklet that I, that I hope all of us will read and study and apply. The other book is when you mentioned the fiqh, you know, the halal haram. It was that he wrote. One of the very first books that were translated to English um, in very good English. And I remember when I was, you know, uh, as a teenager, one of the very first book of books of fiqh that we studied um, and, and just that he wrote for the common folk. He made our religion easy and accessible. Fiqh books before that were written for only the ulama could approach them. But he, he, he really made our religion approachable to us and applicable to us, made it easy for us and, and as such made us love it uh, to apply it, even in the Western world. Like I'm talking about growing up in Canada, um, even in the world, world, he brought it so, our fiqh so close to us. These are some of the books that come to mind. Um, Sister Iman, is there other books or do you have a favorite book of Dr. Sfulkar Dawi that you want to tell us about? So my favorite book, actually, have uh, uh, my. There are two books that I love. Mm -hmm. uh, the one book is the Fiqh al al Muslima, the Fiqh of the Minorities. Um, that book, is, Subhanallah, as Dr. Hisham was talking, Sheikh uh, Qaradawi had the ilm, had the knowledge, mm -hmm. the knowledge of Sharia. And also the knowledge of what we call fiqh al the knowledge of the culture, the current situation. And these are two things that you can learn. But he also had the gift from Allah Azza wa Jal, which is his ability to apply the Islamic knowledge on the current situation. And his courage, because he, as you mentioned in the beginning, he had no problem coming up with these very important 
fiqh new rulings that is that it that fits the current situation he's the first person who said you can buy houses actually he's the one who said you should buy houses if you want to settle in the in the western countries even if you have to take mortgages and that's why subhanallah people may not know but everyone is affected by him directly or indirectly every house in uh, in, in subhanallah uh, the other book that's also my favorite is the um, uh, fiqh al awlawiyat the fiqh of priorities oh, yes. um, and it's just it's, so it's a very important way of understanding where our rulings of fiqh come from what mm-hmm. comes before what and how can you extract the decision how can you make something that's wrong that is very right to be done at that position so his ability and his again ability to come up with all these huge concepts and simplify it and put it on on our current situation is is so dear to my heart subhanallah in addition to all other books that you've mentioned sincerity and halal and haram uh, Lawful and prohibited in Islam. Masha'Allah, Jazakallah khairan. You know, you know, Brother Ahmad, we're talking, uh, Brother Hisham and Sister Iman, they're talking about, you know, his, bo- his books that he wrote so many years ago and how they influenced the previous generation um, and how rulings that he made are just an- influencing people now and they don't even know that this was because Shakhir Fasakar Dawi said they uh, allowed these things that we that, that we live you know even how Muslim women now carry themselves a lot was based upon some of the rulings that he he, he made and the statements that he made um uh, but so I think about the next generation our youth you know the young professionals that you're so closely working with how do we um, make sure that um, they know about him and how do we translate his knowledge and his impact on the next generation um you know it's it, we're I think at a very interesting time right now. And a lot of Muslims are facing a lot of new questions. And we need Sheikh Yusuf Qaradawi now more than ever, but his teachings, they continue. And to how do we hand off one of the things uh, is how do we translate what he was teaching us. And I think now more than ever, we need to push to try to not just embody his teachings in our everyday lives, but to also make his work accessible to all these young and men and women in the West by making initiative to translate all of his books and make it readily available for people to learn and understand and grow together. Um, and really, if we take this step, I think we will be able to hand off this treasure to the next generation and help them understand the, the depth of knowledge that he carried, the treasures that he's embodied with with his teaching and uh, his education. You know, that being said, you know, uh, the, 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 the vision and the mission of our, of our organization is to move people to become God-centered agents of change, right? And so we talk about Yusuf Al-Qardawi as being that example, that North Star, like Ahmed used, of somebody who's God-centered, who's rooted in the prophetic methodology, the prophetic teachings, but always an agent of change, right? And so this was um, part of his, 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 his activism. What do you think um, that helped him become the, this well-rounded, from, from what you know of his upbringing, uh, Dr. Hisham, made him, or the experiences that he went through, made him this well-rounded individual, individual that he became, that he stands out from other ulama? Um, b- before I get into that, can I just make a little comment on the, the mortgage issue? Yes. Because this is important to understand who Yusuf al-Qaradawi is or was. He has such humility that in the in the in like in the mid-80s, early to mid-80s, and maybe into the 90s, early 90s, he was a staunch opponent of using bank loans and mortgages to buy houses in America. He was like going all the way saying, and you know, like this is absolutely not permissible. Afterwards, he himself said. I was wrong and I did not understand your situation. Now that you, that I know it more and I, what you're living, what your experience has been now, I am allowing this as a way for you to establish yourself in the community and in, in the country, et cetera, et cetera. It gives you like, I mean, it, it's not only that, that you know, some, some uh, um, scholars or, or, or you know, ulama of any, of any field would have a very hard time saying something like this, I was wrong. And then he was asked, why did you change your mind? And he was like, you know, he was like laughing and saying, well, maybe when I got older, I got more merciful. 
See, that is, you know, that the, the, you know, you see this uh, in, in him, you know, the, the accepting the change. Um, what he started when he was in third grade to give talks and even khutbat al Jum'ah at the masjid of the, of the village he grew up in. And he was so motivated because he saw the practice. He saw like, you know, this is someone growing, in, growing up in Egypt in a, in a village in the 1930s, you know, as a, as a, you know, a preteen and a teen and where the, 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 all the understanding of Islam was clouded by superstition and by, by bid'ah and by mispractices and so on and so forth. And let alone the, you know, the deviation that happens away from the deen and more in the, in the urban society, but he grew up in the village. So he, he wanted to change that. He wanted to, ch to share as maybe like a 10 year old or a 11 or whatever, uh, uh, you know, age, tender age he was, he wanted to, 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 to share his passion with, with the, the world outside him. And that never stopped. He always wanted to change something. He always wanted to, to do something to affect or, you know, or to, to effect a change in society. That's why as a young man, he joined the Ikhwan al-Muslimin with, he was very impressed with Imam Hassan al-Banna. He wanted to join, to be an agent of change because that's what the Islamic movement is, you know, is, is, is all about. And he now, he went on with not just, I mean, he, he had to discover his own talent. He was a very talent, he is, you know, and he is so far, you know, up until, you know, very late in his, in his, in his years. He is an, it's such a talented uh, shah or poet very, very strong, you know, you, you, you read his poetry. This is like the, the, the poetry from, you know, the olden days, it's really, really very strong. And it's also very passionate, but then he, he also sought advice. He was very flexible in seeking advice from, uh, um, you know, the, the Ustaz uh, al Khali, for example, and Sheikh Al-Maraghi, Sheikh Al-Azhar, Sheikh Shaltut, and so on and so forth. Not sure about Maraghi, I know he was contemporary of Sheikh Shaltut. And, and, and he was guided to, you know what, you have this, this talent of fiqh, you should focus on fiqh. Mm -hmm. Since the 19, 1959, he started writing the Al-Halal Al-Haram and it was published in 1960 for the first time. And then that became, okay, he found himself. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm going to write to make Islam uh, um, accessible to people, to make it, uh, um, you know, but to make it understood, to, to clear all the misunderstandings and the bid'ahs and the superstitions and, and so on and so forth. Not only, but he did not, like other scholars, did not sit at, at home and, and just wrote. He was all the way out until he got in jail. And then when he got in jail, it was a great blessing because then after he got out of jail, he decided, well, maybe I should go live somewhere else. So he went and, and became this Allah alam how it would have been if he had stayed in Egypt, right? Would he have been the same globally renowned, you know, like North Star, like I love this, this uh, expression, Ahmed, by the way, um, you know, subhanAllah, this is again, and, and Allah made it, facilitated everything for him, but we were, he was always about change. He wanted to re, and the way I, you know, I like to put it sometimes, he wanted this Muslim mind to be reformatted on the basis of the Quran and Sunnah from you know, going back to basics. Mm -hmm. And that's his life passion, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. You know, um, related to you mentioned, Dr. Hashem, that he traveled a lot. We know that Sheikh Yusuf al Qardawi, you know, not only did he write, but he was known also to read for hours of the day. Like his family members said that he would read at least 10 hours a day and then he would find time to write. And he would also find time to travel. And you know, he would go to parts of the world that were Muslim majority. Like we know that he was the one who prayed upon uh, Maulana Maududi, his janazah. And, but he also went to places as far as New Zealand and Finland and he would come to the United States and America back in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Why do you think, Sister Iman, why do you think um, well, first of all, was this a, why was this a priority for him? And how do you think it impacted the Muslims globally? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, so subhanAllah, uh, relating to what you just mentioned, I have actually heard a couple of days, now you know when someone passes away, as Dr. Hisham mentioned, people start mentioning the good that they were doing, that we are trying to hide as much as possible, so no one, as a part of his sincerity. But they heard that he recently, with his death in his age, had put his energy together to publish his last book, which is the Fiqh of Salah. 
and that adds to a list, I think, of more than 180 something books that he had. That's Arabic, after that, all the translations. So that tells you his energy that he had and his passion that he had to Islam and to Dawah at that age. And subhanAllah, some of us at the age of 50 and 60 start to think about first retiring from our jobs, then retiring from our Dawah. We've done enough, we've given enough. But subhanAllah, yes, today as I'm driving back from work and it's like, wow, I'm almost half his age. And do I even have a like a very small percentage of his energy and his passion to Islam? Mm -hmm. And his his passion to he wanted to change. So I heard about a story that he had one time. I think he was in Germany and a brother asked him, I have money, I can enough to get married or to go to Hajj. So he said, better go to Hajj, it's a, it's a ruk. Next day, Dr. Qaradawi is on a cruise. And he sees the situation and he sees the level of how people are exposed and whatever. He asks, Aina Sail, I'm just like, where the, where's the person who asked me about Hajj yesterday? Go get married. So his, like, you, you would have forgotten about someone who asked you a question yesterday. You give him a valid answer. But for you to reflect in a minute, the day after and try to ask about the person and, and correct your your um, your fatwa that that tells you that this is someone who's we, we we think that he was he was sincere um he knew that he's being rewarded he had the passion and you can tell that that was his hobby like he would travel for it he would just pull himself from the death the the the, the bed the deathbed to write to the last minute of his life. May Allah Azza wa Jal send his mercy on him and reward him greatly, inshallah. I mean, I mean, yeah, subhanAllah, that was his passion. You know, even when he went and met, um, um, he went to South Africa and he met Nelson Mandela, he made sure to give him some of his books, right? So that he would, you know, leave behind his, his writings and his teachings. So wherever, as the, the corners of the earth that he went to, he made sure that he left his mark, subhanAllah. Um, so Brother Ahmed, you know, all of this that we're talking about, the influential, the influence of Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi, may Allah have mercy on his soul. Tell me you personally, um, what are what what of his teachings influence your understanding the most? You know, we're so blessed to have scholars like Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi and his teachings that, that live on. But when I was reflecting these past couple of days, I was surprised to see how much of an impact in all aspects of my life that he's had. And when I was reflecting on it more, the, the most thing that stood out that I learned from him was when we're looking at the Islamic lens, when we see the world, he was able to show the world that we need to zoom out and see the world through a bird's eye view so we can categorize the big issues, the prominent issues from the small minuscule issues, how we can apply these things in our lives and and know the priorities when he was talking about fiqh al -awliyat, he breaks it down for you this is as a muslim this is how you should um you know think and this type of thought process really i try to imply in my life is to be a big picture thinker how can we as muslims leave a positive impact on society not just for one year five years but for 50 years from now how do we put the seed that will branch out and provide fruit for those to come after us. And this is something that I take to heart and something that I credit it back to him. SubhanAllah, that's beautiful, SubhanAllah, exactly. Looking at the big picture and prioritizing the steps that you're gonna take. Beautiful legacy that he has left with you. May Allah give you the strength to do that. How about you, Dr. Hashem? What do you think the leg your personal in legacy from Dr. Yusuf Farqa that way? I mean, I, I have to say that everything I do in, in, in my life is somehow um, influenced by something I learned from Sheikh al Qaradaw, whether in, in, in understanding, prioritizing things I do in my life or trying to, um, or I mean, all, I'm, when I said everything I do, all the good things I do, not the bad things. So the mm -hmm. bad things are from me, <laughs> but the good things that, that, that I have, yeah, if there's any that I'm doing is, is basically, basically touched by something 
he has said on a TV program or wrote in one of his books or, you know, because when, when, where, where did I learn about the concept of Ibadah from Sheikh Al Qaradawi's book Al Ibadah Fil Islam? Where did I get one of the early introductions to a fiqh from Al Halal Wal Haram? Where did I get you know, my, my, my idea, my worldview about the Islamic movement from his books about, you know, Sahwa al-Islamiyah, the Islamic Awakening, a series of books. Um, where, where, how do I answer questions? If, if anyone asks, ask, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really do it like this, but it's like in the subconscious. What would Sheikh al-Qaradawi say about this question? When someone comes to me, you know, with a, with a marital, you know, fiqhi issue or, or with a, a financial issue or, or, you know, like, you know, I, I would ask myself, why would Sheikh Al-Qaradawi do? I mean, someone with a zakat question, someone with, uh, um, and by the way, he has this wonderful book that is for the highly, highly specialized people, you know, Talabat Al-Ilm, it's, it's called Fiqh Al-Zakat, two volumes, huge. And he does, and he also when you read it, it's the same simple language, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. but very sophisticated uh, arguments about things, things that we, we think we have learned that are, unequivocal or like black and white, you open fiqh al-aqalliyat and you find like, you know, it's like a, he shocks you with going back to basics, but he shocks you in a way that you cannot resist, you cannot refute, you know, because some, some people were making the, the different, what the distinction between one another great like alam or, or like a mountain of, of knowledge of, of, of Sheikh Muhammad al-Ghazali, a contemporary of Sheikh al-Qaradawi, Sheikh Muhammad al-Ghazali gives you what's in his mind that he has understood over the 50 years or something of studying Islam. And he gives it to you like a, you know, a, a 5,000 volt kind of shock, right? While Sheikh al-Qaradawi will say, oh, that's a good question. Let's go back to basics. Let's see what the Quran says. Let's see what the Prophet sallallahu says. Let's see what the Sahaba say. You know, I would never imagine that if someone, if, if I mean, I never imagined that it was even there in fiqh that if, if, if a, if a, if a non-Muslim woman who was married to a non-Muslim man and then she embraced Islam, I said, okay, well, she has to separate from it. No, he said, well, there are like 11 opinions or nine opinions between the Sahaba. It's like, really, is this in our heritage? He brings it back. Mm -hmm. And he says, this is what, you know, uh, uh, this is what, you know, all the centuries, of, of inertia in the fiqh, because there's a lot of that. And, and here's what actually, let's go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's the, his, uh, his, his, his impact on, on me among other millions already and millions to come, inshallah. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. Yes, SubhanAllah. You know, when Dr. Hashem, you're mentioning yourself, your impact on your, like you said, imagine the millions of people who have the same, same answer as you and his impact on, you know, may, may Allah reward him for each of each of these individuals, subhanAllah. Yeah, I mean, well, the Sheikh has literally, at this moment, he has multiple millions of students that he, don't, he doesn't know, you know, like me. <laughs> so, once I just sent him a, a fatwa about something that was happening back in, 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 in Arizona and, and okay, that's the only direct connection I had, but he had millions like me, you know. Yeah. I'm better, much better though. <laughs> you know, Sister Iman, I want to ask you a question and, you know, it's come up a little bit about Sheikh Yusuf Qadawi's um, uh, opinions and fatawa on, on Muslim women and the status of women in Islam and things like that. Um, uh, Dr. Hisham just mentioned one about when a, Muslim, a woman becomes a Muslim, you know, um, and you, you had, a, you said you have an opportunity to, to um, interview him. And now you are, mashallah, a career woman, you're a professor, you're also part of the Islamic movement and the da'wah work. Um, you know, tell our audience a little bit about the, the impact of Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi's um, on, on the Muslim woman today. You know, because he was growing up in the 50s and 60s where things were very different back then for Muslim women and where we yeah. come. He actually has a book at the status of women in Islam. I think it's in the late 90s. In SubhanAllah, when you read the, read, the, the writings of Sheikh Qaradawi, um, he presents an Islam in a way, a new way of practicing Islam. You feel that this Islam is not rigid and makes you see that it as a living thing. Uh, so based, based on a divine, but able to address issues at all ages of time. 
uh, subhanAllah, it's really, it really makes you feel that Islam is, is a living thing. It fits, it really what it means when we say Islam fits every time and every place. This is the exact implementation of his fatawa. That it's it it is he actually was the one who said do not wear do not wear black abayas whether I agree or disagree with him in the United States if you're going out if you're going in public don't dress head to toe in black and and people don't have to follow this but his point of view this is how in the media they would show, show you to be oppressed so change that. So there's lots of fatwa, again, as I'm saying, whether you agree or disagree, you respect his opinion. You respect that he cares about the small details and while he looks at the big pictures of things. Mm. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. You know, um, the, the, this, is, this is exactly what he, why people respected him because he had that forward looking, you know, and things that when he, like I said, when, when we, he first said it, we would kind of be taken aback. But when we really think, he's really thinking about the maqasid, like what is the goal? What is the spirit of... You know, and 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 how do I ha make it easier for the ummah to stick to the religion? Um, that's why he, you know, he said if Muslim women can go to work, they can be leaders. He has a, you know, like a, he's written about the leadership of women and the role of women on Muslim um, board when he used to come to the West, on boards of masajid and and speakers because they, you know what they can give to the community. Just and it was at that time mind blowing because it was separated sisters and brothers, right? I remember in the Maya, you talked about the Maya convention. There was no, you know, we sisters and brothers would not be in the same space. I remember that until actually Sheikh Flagrat Dawi made a statement about that. Why are we not allowing the sisters to speak and to be in the same space and to, to allow them to, to, to um, you know, engage with the rest of us? So subhanAllah, this is, was his visionary. Another part of it, Ahmad, that I want to, you know, because I work with Ahmad on the national team, mashallah, Ali, he always has, he always comes up to me and says, Sister Iman, I have this really novel idea. I have this really innovative project. You know, he's really the one that's got these new ideas, mashallah, on our team. And, and when I was thinking about Sheikh Yusuf the other day, um, Ahmad, you actually came to mind because I thought about, uh, you know, when the radio started, he was on the radio. When, when the, you know, we talked so much about his books, but when the TV started, he was on TV. Millions, 80 million viewers across the world are watching him. When the World Wide Web came upon, he said, how am I going to learn to use it? And how am I going to make sure I make Dawa through it? So tell, you know, um, tell me a little bit about how you think, you know, how we and today's generation have, how, have to become relevant in the technology and the resources that we have around us following the footsteps of Yusuf Kardaw. I, you know, he, he was a role model in the sense that he was fearless. Anything that we'd come across, he had the, the vision to say, I'm going to be brave and I'm going to use this because I have a message to deliver. Maybe people will listen, maybe people won't. But I, I, he was driven by this passion to reach every single person in society, regardless of who they were. And this is evident what everyone here was speaking about in, in his conveying of the message and his ability to connect with people. And I think as we move forward, it's not about the technology, it's not about uh, all the new gadgets, but it's really how do I use this to deliver the words of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? How do I do, deliver this to rebalance everyone's compass? So that way they're headed in the right direction. And I think his sincerity is what made him successful. His sincerity when he was on the radio show, his sincerity when he was on the TV, he really had one goal in life. And that was to deliver this message. So that way, when he faces Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can say, I did my part. And I hope that we all, anyone that's listening to this, can embody this message. Whether big or small, what capacity that we have, that we follow in his footsteps to transmit this message. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. So don't be afraid to take that new resource, hold it in your hand and say, how can I make it work for me and not against me? You know, we don't have, exactly. because there was Salama at that time, oh, this is haram. And, you know, no, he was like, how am I going to make it good for us? It's just incredible, SubhanAllah. You know, we could talk about Sheikh Yusuf the four of us, for a long time, um, that I would, I, you know, for the sake of the podcast, I'm going to go around one more time and just say, from our discussions, um, each one of you share with me what you think has been left out, or what you think um, uh, is the most 
may, you know, thing that will be forever remembered um, by the Muslim Ummah in two years to come. You know, your last, your last input, uh, your last thing that you want to say about Sheikh Lutfi Qardawi, uh, Dr. Hisham. It's a very tough to uh, a very tough choice to make, but I would say that Sheikh Yusuf Al Qardawi will be remembered as one of the mujaddideen that the Prophet Sallallahu promised this Ummah that they will have people coming uh, um, a, a, across, you know, along throughout the centuries, coming to renew the adherence of this Ummah and the understanding of this Ummah to its uh, um, to its deen. Now, this is, doesn't mean that you have to name one person every, for every century, because in this century, we have Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi, we have uh, Imam Hassan al-Banna, I mean, for the past century, we have, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Abdul Karim Zidane, we have Imam Abu al-A'la al-Mawdudi, we have Abu al-Hassan al-Nadwi, we have like so many people, and that the, but the Qaradawi is, is, is the star, is, is the one who is going to be, most remembered as this encyclopedic, you know, figure that will probably not be replaced one to one in any 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 uh, uh, near future, but rather his legacy will be inherited by different people, by people inheriting his approach in fiqh, people inheriting his approach in dawa, his approach in activism and in, and in, in, in the um and and the this passion for the ummah and so on and so forth. I don't think a one-on-one, -on -one, Allahu A'lam, of course, I don't know the ghaib, but I don't think like uh, 10 years or five years from now we say, oh, here is the, here's the successor of Sheikh Yusuf al -Qarada. I don't think that it's going to, uh, to, to be the case, Allahu A'lam. Uh, but we will see many, many people already see them uh, mm -hmm. filling in different aspects of what, what he has, uh, what he lived his life for, Allahu A'lam. This is really a message of hope, Dr. Hashem, because many of us were so sad, you know, who's going to replace him? Who's going to replace him, you know? But this is hopeful that it doesn't have to be one person. He was enough of, um, you know, a great man with an encyclopedia, like you said, that many people uh, are and, and those, to those people don't happen, you know, they, they don't come, you know, quite often. I mean, if you think of, you think of the four Imams and you think of uh, Ibn, 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 Ibn Taymiyyah, you think of Ibn Al-Qayyim, you think of, uh, Imam al Noah, when you think of those people, they don't happen like, you know, every, every 10 years or so. They're, they're as long, as it, it, but there's going to be, inshallah, a legacy, and the legacy will be well preserved and, and further, inshallah, along. Amen. Amen. Sister Iman, what would, what would you like to add? What's um, subhanallah, the, as we were talking, I was thinking about how when someone dies, uh, there are a few things that basically the, their their amal, their their action and their hasanat keeps on adding to their balances. And Sheikh Qaradawi have left many of these. He, he didn't only leave his kids who was actually making dua for him, but he left, as Dr. Hisham mentioned, many, many people who are like, love him, who've never seen him, who he may not, of course, doesn't know their names, but they're making dua for him. Uh, I got the news of his death as a, a few days would come out for Qiyam, and that was one of the few days. So I wake up and I got the news, and this is all what I could remember making dua for during my Qiyam. May Allah send his mercy, his mercy on him. Uh, the other thing is that, <laughs> funny, when I heard his the death news of his death, I was like, oh, I, I, I needed to learn more from him. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> it's not enough. And that tells you, subhanAllah, that there's some opportunities of ilm that can come your way. So use them. Sheikh Qaradawi lived for 90, almost 97 years. So what more I was waiting for? And we overlapped a lot. And I, there was many opportunities to learn more from him while he's alive. So if you find someone, of course, yani, there, Allah Azza wa Jalla's rizq is wasa. So he may send us, inshallah, another scholar. So if you find one of these, like use the opportunity and don't just uh, procrastinate. Um, I loved him for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, and I, I Subhanallah, make dua for him all the time, and I can see that how much, how many people now are coming, like and talking about him, and how they're affected by him, and that by itself says a lot. May Allah Azza wa send His uh, mercy upon him, inshallah, and provide us with a replacement, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Ahmed. I, you know, the like you said there's so much that we could say we could go for hours hours and days 
but just reflecting on what was said is that you know Imam Ahmed, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, when they were alive, people didn't appreciate them for what they were. And they didn't appreciate the sacrifices that them and their families made for this religion. And when we look back at Sheikh Yusuf Qarabawi, the impact that he's left, I think we will appreciate him more and fall in love with him more in the days and years to come. And I hope, I hope that whoever is watching or whoever is reading his books, that they pick up where he left off as a champion for justice, a champion for those that didn't have a voice, a champion for change for the better for all of society. And this is what I hope that the future brings, inshallah. SubhanAllah. That's exactly what I wanted to kind of wrap this up with, Ahmed. The fact that with all of his knowledge um, and he made he was the champion of social justice and <clears throat> social reform, um, you know, he was the one that would never stop talking about uh, the plight of the Palestinians, um, the plight uh, he spoke about against tyranny and against uh, the dictatorships that around him. Um, and so as, as the time goes by, that will be part of his legacy also because we are facing Islamophobia, we're facing our children are facing bullying in the school. We, we, we sometimes have to hide. Um, and the idea that you, you tied in his, he was fearless in the, in, the, in the face of these things. And he stood for his, he knew what was right. He knew it was wrong. And he always spoke for the truth um, wherever he was and whatever time um, he, he, he said about himself, no one could ever call me a hypocrite because I always you know, stood my ground and did not bow to any pressure that came from those above me. So it's another beautiful part of his, and you know, if we keep on going, we'll remember something else about him, another part of his, his character. And so um, I wanted to um, end up our conversation thanking each and every one of you for your insight, for your input, uh, for what you've shared today. I'd like to encourage all our listeners to go and look up these books. Many of them have been, uh, most have been, that were mentioned today, have been translated to English, good English, alhamdulillah. Uh, read about um, uh, Sheikh Yusuf Rakhada. We look up some of his um, uh, recordings online. Um, um, if you go to our um, Muslim American Society social media, we have some ideas for you in which you can get some more information about Sheikh Yusuf Al-Qaradawi and maybe even hold an event in your location, your locality to honor him and to help the youth and the families and the people in your space to remember his legacy. Um, and so, you know, I again, thank each and every one of you for being here. Thank you for your input. May Allah accept from you your time and your energy, the years that you have put into his dawa. And, um, uh, and may Allah accept from our dear beloved uh, Sheikh Yusuf Al-Qaradawi um, and make everything that we have learned from him and the generations that will come learn from him a sadaqa jariya basically for him Amen. more and more on his on his scales for him until the end of time again thank you all this is iman ateya mass national today director signing off a pleasure being hosting this special remastered podcast episode until next time assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh